Another Monday night Bible studies. I'm excited, as always, to have the opportunity and the privilege to share with you the wonderful words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's Monday and the 3rd of August, in fact, and I'm so honored and privileged to have the opportunity to be with you. Just had to turn my mic down on the other computer because that was playing right back into this mic. So <clears throat> thank you again for joining me. I hope you're having a fantastic, wonderful, beautiful day. The weather is truly, truly incredible. It's amazing. I was out there today doing some speed walking, trying to do some exercise. And um, it was truly amazing outside. So Glad to be back with you today, and uh, we will get started in the next two minutes' time. Just always, as always, want to make sure that all the sound and picture quality is up to speed. And I want to say welcome to everyone who's joining us, and thank you so much, those of you that's always on time. And we do appreciate you guys. Do appreciate you guys greatly and thank you so much for coming online today as i say we get started in just a minute and a half time yes everything seems to be working perfectly well so let me get back on the set and again i want to say welcome to everyone who's joining us you can go ahead and leave a message in the chat room if you want, and uh, we will pick that up from you. So thank you again for joining us. We do appreciate that. Right. Just a few advertisements then. Uh, not much, really. Today we have uh, our ongoing prayer services throughout the week. We also have the online Bible studies. We may not be here on Wednesday, in fact. We have a death in our local church. And I'm called away to lead a Zoom service for our dear brother. So um, we may or we may not be here on Wednesday. I think we might be, but I, I won't be there. But we'll try and get somebody to, to run the show for us. So bear those in mind, I'm also promoting big time, um, let me go over there now, uh, this beautiful website. I think it's truly amazing, actually. I think that my picture in this website is really good. I think that's make me look good, actually, this website. And uh, there's some beautiful stuff on it, um, really some awesome stuff. So I think you should take a look at it. It's Sandra May. And... Uh, let me put their website address up for you. And there it is, SandraMearDesigns.com. You've got to take a look at that website. Even if you don't buy anything, right, you've got to take a look around. At least you get to see what's there. And you can actually send it to your friends and let them see the website. I think the website is, is awesome. So a lot of good stuff there. I intend to... Um, Take a, another good look. I think she's done really amazingly. So even go there and get your um your your face covering. Some beautiful face mask for women. I think I should get one of the women one, isn't it? I think I should get one of the women one. Um some some ones there. It's truly, truly good. They got sale as well. Face mask for women. That's a good one, isn't it? I think that's a good design, actually. I didn't see that one. Beautiful one. Okay, well done, Sandra. Claudia, how you doing? Ronnie Miller, how you doing? Welcome. Thanks for joining us. And uh, glad to have you guys with us tonight. I'll just showing off Sandra May's designs. Um, you've got to go to that website. I mean, that, that particular, that's a great one. It doesn't even look as if it's COVID, isn't it? It just looks like fashion. It looks kind of cool. Get my wife to wear one of those. Yeah, I think she would love it. Looks cool. Thanks. Anyway. Right, here we go then. 
as you know, we've been looking at the series of 10 controversies in the church. And, um, you know, it truly is amazing some of the things that's going on in the church, in the body of Christ. But before we go any further, let me pray. Jean, welcome. Thank you so much. Greetings to you all. Thank you for joining us. Chris Allen, how are you doing, sir? Let's pray. Father, what a joy to have access to your word. Your word that is spirit and life. Pray, Father God, as we study your word tonight, to show ourselves approved unto you, so that we be not ashamed and rightly divide the word of truth. That we call upon you, Father God, to release unto us your Holy Spirit, who will guide, will direct, and protect us, and teach us. Have your way with us, Father God, and pray that you will keep us away from erroneous teachings, that we may know the truth that will set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, 10 controversies, and there are more, obviously, but I've chosen what I regard as my top 10. And again, I, I've, I've completed some, so if you haven't watched those, then the links are at YouTube. And so we have looked at quite a few of them. So we've looked at homosexuality, and I have shown through Scripture that it's not the will of God. It is definitely not God's intention that man would sleep with man and woman would sleep with woman. It's regarded by the Lord as an abomination, something that's detestable and not within his will. I do know that there are lots of questions and comments that has been raised on this subject. And, um, you know, I have every sympathy and love and compassion towards, you know, homosexual people. They are people as well. And uh, we are to love them just like we love anybody else. And we are not to treat them indifferently or with any form of disrespect or dishonor, but to care for them as we would anybody else. And um, God is a good God. You know, God is a good God. And uh, there's so much around this topic that is truly, truly amazing. They have their own Bible now, which is, a, to me, a disaster. And they have laws that protects them and allows them to be married just like any other persons um, around many countries in the world. Women are now um, bishops and pastors within churches. They have their own churches and um, it goes on. But it's not God's will. There's nothing in Scripture that would in any way, shape, or form agree with the homosexual community. Nothing in Scripture. Everything is against it. It's totally a no-no. So that is my um, conclusion on that matter. God has made it quite clear that it is not within his will, whatsoever. Good evening to you, Sister Anna. Yeah, sorry about Friday. What happened Friday now? Let me see now. Friday. Oh, my gosh, Friday. What happened on Friday? Why we didn't do the show? You know, I just can't remember why Friday. Something happened on Friday. I can't remember. If I remember, I'll let you know. But it's still going on. It's It's... But we were there. What there on Friday? Didn't I do a show on Friday? I just can't remember what happened on Friday. It's Friday is so long ago for me. But so if I remember, I'll let you know. But we, but it's still going on. The Friday shows are still going on, um, without a shadow of a doubt. So I, I think, aha, I remember now. What happened is that someone in our church died. A young man in our church died. And I had to go to the family's home. 
you know, pray, you know. So I, I just couldn't, um, couldn't get away from that. I was trying to go earlier, but it didn't happen. So I went and I just couldn't get away in time for the show. In fact, I misjudged where they lived. I thought they only lived like three miles from here, but it was around eight. So that was a major challenge. So that was us a one-off, hopefully. Uh, good evening to you as well, Sister Sandra. Uh, thank you for your, sh oh, I'm gonna shout you out as much as I can. Um, I'm gonna shout you as much as I can. So get used to me, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Appreciate that. Sister Christine, I think I hold your phone call, don't I? All right, so homosexuality is a no-no with God, but we've got to understand though, that there are lots of people who are struggling with it and there's a lot of issues surrounding it. So we need to, be compassionate and very loving. Right, on the issue of abortion, which I've completed, um, I've concluded that, according to scripture, that abortion is murder. Now, I do know that a lot of people have, you know, before they came into the church, and even in the church, have, you know, aborted their child and do regret it later and is i don't wish to uh what's the word i don't wish to offend anybody i don't wish to hurt anyone i don't wish to um do anything like that but the truth has got to be told and the truth is really that abortion is not the will of god never has been it isn't and it never will be his will. Abortion is murder. It's the taking of a life and God says, thou shalt not kill. Those were his exact words. And I want to remind us again that 8.8 .8 million abortions or murders have occurred since 1968 when the law came into force until 2019th of December of last year. So within that time, 8.8 .8 million people, and the number is, is greater, especially when you look at those illegal abortions taking place without the knowledge of the law and so on. It was introduced into um, Parliament by MP David Steele. So I want to ask him the question today because he's still alive. What would you say now? knowing that 8.8 .8 million murders have taken place. And what's furthermore interesting, in America, since 1973 when it came into force, till 2011, that's nine years ago, 52.6 million. So the number since then is probably in the 60 million figure and so on. Now, it's just truly amazing to me personally, but that's what's happening within the abortion field. And that is truly, truly amazing. Now, I also dealt with should Christians drink? And that is truly an amazing one because in our teaching, we teach against adultery, Sorry, about against we teach against homosexuality, we teach against abortion, and we also teach against drinking. However, there is no biblical verse that I can turn to to say, if you drink wine and alcohol, you're going to hell, or you're not going to make it into heaven. I can find no verse other than no drunkards will make it in. So the scripture talks about that. I don't drink because, not because I don't like it. I think drinking was something I enjoyed before I came to Christ. I just want to tell you the truth and be as transparent as I can. I used to drink drinks like Malibu, 
my Guinness punch, you know, on a Sunday, man, you couldn't give me my dinner without Guinness punch. <laughs> you could know, have my Guinness punch on the table, you know, baby sham and snowball. Is it snowball? Something like that. Anyway, stones, ginger wine. Oh my God. I used to fall in love with stones, ginger wine and uh, Southern comfort, Malibu, Southern comfort. You know, you can tell the drinks that I like because they were very sweet in taste and I haven't drank since what 1984 or so so I somehow managed to stay away from it I wasn't a heavy drinker in the first place so one of the reasons why I stopped drinking was because I, I don't trust myself and if I have one sip I might want two and three and four and where does it end for me I, d I don't have any Bible verses other than ones I've found for myself which says it's not for kings to drink wine or for princes strong drink because they may do so and pervert justice and so on. So I don't drink simply because I don't trust myself. And I've found a few verses that indicate that I shouldn't drink because I'm a king. So I refer to myself as a king. So if you go to Proverbs 20, verse 1, uh, or Proverbs um, 31, where, you know, verse in the first few verses where it says it's not for kings. So I regard myself as a king and so on, so I don't drink. But there's no verse that says you're going to hell or you're going to heaven. But our teaching is against it. So if you're a member of the Church of God Prophecy, we do strongly teach against wine and strong drink. The next thing that we covered, um, we covered two aspects of this. And um, the first aspect was to do with speaking in tongues. Massive issue in the church, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's so big. Now, I know that not everyone agrees with me. And that's understandable because, you know, there's oddly much agreement across the board when it comes to the scriptures speaking in tongues you could find that in mark 16 verse 17 come through the book of acts where they spoke in tongues in the day of pentecost at Cornelius's house and up in ephesus with the the group of 12 people there and also um first corinthians chapter 12 chapter 13 and and the famous one is 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that spells out in detail how it should be done in the church today, which most churches do not follow. So, um, in a nutshell then, if I put it in this nutshell, and when I first came to the local church I'm in, people were just speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues in the service and so on. People were really coming to me about it and they were asking me this is conf you know they tell me this is confusing they're asking me what you're going to do about it and so on and so forth so we had an agreement because this came up for a very long time and we, we had an agreement that we would sit and talk about it for one day so we put aside one whole saturday we got all the leaders around 30 40 of us we had lunch together and and we talked. It wasn't a teaching session. It was a talking session. I chair that. And we talked from 10 o'clock in the morning to 6 in the afternoon. And then we felt we hadn't finished. So we had another day. I think it was a, a year later because we just couldn't find a day in the diary. And at the conclusion, this is how I concluded it. This is, a, a, if I can remember correctly, I concluded this way. That we are a church that believes in speaking in tongues and we well let me put it this way because we may have members from my local church that will say well i don't think that's how i understood it so let me qualify that this is how i understood it and this is how i communicated it back to the church and i said we are a local church that believes and practice speaking in tongues we encourage it that any member who wants to speak in tongues and so on should speak in tongues, um, and so on. So we don't discourage it. We encourage people to speak in tongues. However, 
If a person speaks in tongues and there is no interpretation, that person has to stop and will be stopped by me if they don't stop. If there is no interpreter, then I will stop that person um, from speaking in tongues because the scripture clearly states there should be interpretation. When you go through, and I did a verse-by-verse -verse analysis of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 from verse 1 right down to the end. All right? So it's very, very important for us to understand that. So I, I know I go to convocations, I go places, I watch on TV, and people speaking in tongues, and there's no interpretation. And then I ask myself the question, which verse did they follow? Which chapter are they going by? Because I can't find that in the scriptures. So speaking in tongues is greatly, greatly promoted. And you know, there's a scripture that surprised a lot of people in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which says, the person that prophesied is greater than the person who speaks in tongue, except there is an, uh, an interpreter. So if there is an interpreter, then the prophecy is equal to the speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues. So where they're speaking of tongues in a church setting, because 1 Corinthians 14 is giving us the layout as to how we should operate in the church. And I don't see that happening um, at, around me. So, But people have their own different views and their own different beliefs and so on. The other thing that we, disc we, we dealt with um, around the spiritual gifts is the voice of God. The, even though it's not a gift in sense of spiritual gift, but the voice of God is such a major, major concern. How do we know the voice of God? I, I, I really don't understand how this could be a complex issue at all. I don't understand how the voice of God is even a debate. Well, that's just from my perspective, right? Because the voice of God is the Word of God. That's it. Period. The voice of God is the Word of God from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to Revelation. The voice God has spoken. He has spoken so clearly and so powerfully to all of us. And um, as I said before, God can speak through dreams, through visions, through nature, through animals if he wants to. God can do whatever he likes, but God will never contradict his word. Therefore, everything that we have need of is in the word of God. It's all there for us. Okay, let's take, for example, relationship, which is a really massive area for us. What about relationship is not covered in the scriptures? God, through his infinite wisdom, through the Holy Spirit, has given us everything we need about relationship in the Word of God. Let me give you one of the biggest relationship tips. If any man is listening or woman is listening and you're married, I'm going to give you one of the greatest Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's, and I could say to you, thus says the Lord, and be 100 billion percent certain it was God who said it. Hear what he says in relationship. Husbands, if there's any husbands listening, I'm one of them. He says, husbands, love your wife. That's the word of God. It is clear. It is specific. It is direct. There is no beating around the bush concerning what God just said. No, I didn't say. The word of God said it. Husbands, love your wives. Now, what we husbands need to do is to study the scriptures to understand how we should love our wives. 
here's one that the Lord says to the women. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Now, I know that a lot of women, when we <laughs> read that, well, when we say we read that, we've got to understand clearly what we're saying here. A lot of women don't approve of what God said. Because it wasn't man who said it. It's God who says it, that we should submit. Now, listen to this carefully. I was speaking to a brother one morning. He might be listening right here. If he's there, let me know if you're there, Brother Michael. Brother Michael and I, we were having a beautiful conversation. We got to church. We probably was at church around 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 a.m. in the morning. We were there to do our Sunday morning breakfast for the homeless, homeless breakfast. So Brother Mike came upstairs because he was downstairs doing all the preparation and cooking stuff and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm upstairs getting the church ready for service. So he comes up for a chat because we, we had this, you know, this window. And we were talking about relationship, about husbands loving your wives and about wives submitting and so on. And I made this statement to him. And another brother was listening. He had come in quite early that morning, not for the breakfast or for service, but he came to do something else. And he was in my office and I didn't realize he was overhearing our conversation. And he came out after Mike had gone and questioned me about what I said. And this is what I said. I asked Michael the question, which one comes first? Husbands love your wives or wives submit to your husband? Because we husbands, oh, well, we want the wife to submit, all right. Oh, we love that bit. But many of us are not concentrating on husbands love your wives. So I said to him, which one comes first? People always say it's like the chicken and the egg story. You know, which one comes first? It's very obvious which one came first, the chicken or the egg. It's obvious it was the chicken. I mean, come on. God didn't make two eggs. He made them male and female and all the chicken and all of that stuff. The chicken came first. Let's take it from me. The chicken came first, right? So basically I ask him, which one came first? Which is more important? And um, people were stuck on that one. Well, let me say this quite clearly. The scripture says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Now, none of us would serve Christ unless Christ had demonstrated his love for us. Christ's love came first before we submitted. It was the proving and the demonstration of his love for us that caused us to submit. Now, I've been to so many men's conferences. I've been to all of them. I've organized them <laughs> over the years. We've had a, probably around 10 or 11 men's conferences. And I've been to other conferences that other men have organized. And there is a thread that runs through all of them that we men spend most of our time blaming the woman. You know, when God came to Adam and said, Adam, what have you done? <laughs> what did he say? It's that woman that thou gavest to me. And ever since Adam been blaming the woman, we've been doing the same. So I was in one conference when the men got up and they talked about the women and and so on. I got very incensed. I was very angry. I was very disappointed. And I wanted to speak. Now, I'm the overseer, but I wasn't leading that particular men's service. So I had to put my hand up and wait just like everybody else. And when I got up, I said this. I hear what you're all saying, but I want to ask you one simple question. 
Does your wife know if you love her? Does your wife know? I'm not talking about you telling her that you love her. I'm asking, does she through experience <coughs> believe that you love her? Because it's easy to talk about, you know, this and that and the other. But the focus, I think, should be upon us men loving our wife. And I've often said to men in conferences that <coughs> any man that can prove his love for his wife, that woman would have no problem serving that man. Absolutely none whatsoever. And so when we're talking about the voice of God, which is what I was talking about, God's word makes it very clear about relationships. We don't need no more new word. We have enough for us to get on with. We, we have enough in order. The scripture gives us everything that we have need of. God has already spoken. He's not going to speak again. There is no, this, the, let me put it this way. The scriptures or what we call the canon is closed. It took 1,500 years to write from the time of Moses to the time of Revelation in John on the island of Patmos is a period of 1,500 years. There is no more new scripture to be added. So, for example, what the homosexual community did by writing a new Bible or new verses, they will have their punishment according to Revelation, who they've added and they've taken away. They've got their punishment to come. Okay, so that's very, 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 very clear. So, God's voice is not difficult to understand. God's voice is not difficult to detect. There is no assumption about God's voice because His Word is His voice. I just want to make that clear. I want to say it again. I'm laboring the point because I think I need to. God's voice is His word. I hear God's voice every day. I hear God's voice when I'm in the bathroom, when I'm in the toilet, when I'm walking because I'm meditating upon His voice. I'm, I am running it through my mind. I'm meditating over and over in my bed. I can, his voice just keeps speaking to me because His voice is His word. His word. I don't know why people can't understand that. I don't, I don't know what's so, what's so difficult to understand. Let me put it another way. If I was leaving the United Kingdom and I'm going to another country and I won't be back for three weeks and I wrote a letter to you giving you instructions as to what to do, then that's my word. That's my voice. You're not going to get any more instructions. You're not going to get any more information. I'm giving you what I'm giving you because it's sufficient for you to continue to carry out the work that you need to. On top of that, not only have I left you the letter, I'm going to leave you an assistant to guide you through the letter so that you can understand clearer and clearer exactly what I mean by what's in that letter. And that's exactly what God has done. He has given us His Word and He has given us His Holy Spirit so there can be no mistake about what He has said. And I don't understand why people are so confused. You know, I get people all the time saying to me, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said. And it has no bearing on Scripture. Now, if a person came to me and says, the Lord said, Errol, you should not steal, I, I'll believe him. I will definitely believe him because there's chapter and verse in God's words that demonstrate that I shouldn't do that. If someone comes to me and said, Errol, you, you mustn't commit adultery. I said, yes, I, I believe you're hearing from the Lord because that's the word of God that said, thou shalt not commit adultery. If a man comes to me and said, Errol, I think you should leave your wife and sleep with another man. That, that, that's definitely... Not from the Lord. <laughs> no, 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 no. Leave my wife? In fact, by leaving my wife, I've made a mistake. 
Okay. Now, we have not yet got on to marriage, but I want to make a point. Just before, let's go to, um, let's, let's look at this for a moment. We're not on marriage, but while I'm on it, um, the scripture makes it very clear um, that, you know, um, um, I'm going to find that scripture for you. I'm going to find that scripture. I'm trying to remember where it is. Uh, I, I knew it was 1 Corinthians 7. Yeah, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. Let's have a look at that. And if you have any questions or comment, go ahead and put those in the chat room for me. And I would appreciate that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to show you something. Right. Um, now, <clears throat> the unmarried and the widowed. Um, and he says, uh, let me go from verse 25, but verse 27 is my key, key verse here. He says, yeah, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that has ordained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose... Therefore, that this is good for the present distress, I say that it's good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Now, let's look at this carefully. Art thou bound unto a wife? Let's look at this. It's a question. Are you bound to a wife? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm bound to June. <laughs> we took a covenant. Now, I, I just want to stop there. Because what I'm about to say next could get me in trouble. But you know, it doesn't matter because I have Bible to get me out of trouble. It asks a question. Art thou bound unto a wife? Well, then it could be bound unto a husband. What does it mean I'm bound unto? Well, I'm in covenant with a woman that I took a vow to be with for the rest of my life until death do us part. I signed that contract that day, 26th of April, 1986. I signed on the contract. I, I signed. I, I think that's my signature down there, something like that. I signed on the contract. <laughs> I signed it. And that was on the... 19th of April 1986 I signed it I, I did that in the presence of God and I did that in the presence of people it is a legal document in heaven and on earth so there is no doubt in my mind that I am bound unto a wife. I am absolutely bound. It's the next phrase that is key. Seek not to be loosed. Okay? Seek not to be loosed. Did you see that? This is not a suggestion. This is a command from the Lord. Now, this is not Paul talking. This is, this is the scriptures. All scriptures given by inspiration. Now, if I seek to be loosed, that means I am breaking the commandment. If I'm looking at how to get loosed away from her, if, if I'm looking to see how I can break away, you know, and go off with Mildred down the road. I'm breaking the commandment. I'm going against God's will. It is, it, I mean, it is as clear as daylight. Now, you may say to me, well, but supposing he's beating me. Where did it say that in here that he's, you can be loose if he's beating you? But he's too rich. He's got too much money and I, I want to leave him. <laughs> I mean, where does it say that in that text? 
it clearly states, seek not to be loose because I'm already bound. How am I bound? I'm bound legally. I'm bound, bound in the presence of God and these weaknesses here present. I have signed my signature onto it. You can see my signatures here. I have signed my signature. I am now bound to June, whether I like it or not. Now, this is interesting. You know, in the um, in the covenant that we took, yeah, I know it's not in the Bible, but I still did take it. That's why the scripture says only fools make vows and differ to pay. So in the contract, I said something like, until in, in sickness and in health, until death do us part, for, rich, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. <laughs> you see how I really kind of tie myself up? I, I might as well have said, I might as well have said on the wedding day, I might as well have said something like this. I might as well have said, um, June, I take thee to me, my lawful wedded wife, for 10 years. Or unless there's you commit adultery or you do these things, I, 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 if you don't, if you do those things, I leave. I might as well take out that kind of contract. It makes kind of sense then. Then based upon that contract, then I can do what I like. If something goes wrong, then I, I can therefore then disappear. So what's the point of saying until death do us part? No, 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 hold on a second. Hold on a second. If you are not married, take my advice. And you, you don't mean until death do us part? Then do not. Either do not get married or do not say that in God's presence on these people because then you will be a liar. You, you see, because what, what happened is I, I said until death do us part. I didn't say until adultery do us part or until you're not cooking for me do us part or until you lose your teeth you know your your um dentures you know you're now having to wear dentures until your until dentures do us part that's not what we said we said until death do us part so what does that mean i just want somebody who can help me to understand when we make a vow until death do us part, what does that mean? But furthermore, I would say, what does it mean, seek not to be loose? The scripture makes it quite clear that I should not at any stage or at any time during my marriage seek to be loose because I'm, I'm bound to her. I've taken out a covenant. I've taken out an agreement. It's interesting Though we're not on marriage, I don't know why it's come up in my head. They ask Jesus this question, you know. They ask him the question. They ask him, then why did Moses give a bill of divorcement? Jesus answered that question so correctly that it would have taken me a, a millennium to try and figure out what Jesus said. Because Jesus, Jesus said that, um, he said to them that um, because, I want you to notice now what caused the problem. Are you ready for this? I'm sure you know what I'm going to say. Because of the hardness, the hardness, hardness of what? Of the heart. That's the problem. The hardness of the heart. You know, Jesus didn't mince his words, and sh neither should we. Matthew 5, you'll find that, I believe. Um, not 5, Matthew 9, somewhere along the line. Or 19. Now, seek not to be loosed. So, guess what? I'm bound, right? I'm bound to this beautiful woman called June. I've been with her now for 40 years. We've been married 36 or something like that. And, um, you know, I have my ways. I'm sure, you know, <laughs> June don't like sort of things I do. But um, the scripture says, 
Art thou bound unto a wife, Errol? Well, my name is not there, but you could put it there. Are you bound? Seek not to be loose. That's the voice of God talking. That's the point I'm trying to make. Anyway, let me, I don't know why I'm going on this road because I have something I want to share with us um, other than this, but um, I thought I would share that. So let me therefore then go to the chat room and see if there are any comments that I need to address. Good evening, all. Good evening, Pastor. Uh, 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 also, Sister Jenny and Sister Elithia. Welcome to you all. Blessings to you all. And thank you so much for joining us. Let me go over to Facebook and see if there are anything I need to pick up on. Right. Good evening to you, Ven. Um, welcome. Welcome, Chris. Christine, Sister Valerie in Jamaica. Is it, I, I hear there's a lot of mangoes there. Wow, I wish I was over in Jamaica now. Um, yes, we are having a wonderful weather here. In fact, I have a special spot that I go normally, not every day, but I'm going to try and see if I can get there every day, just even for a few minutes. It's just truly amazing. It's what I call my, my Monte Carlo view. You know, Monte Carlo is an amazing place. i um, been there once and it just truly blew my mind. Um, good evening to you, Brother Stanley. Welcome. Greetings to you again. Elaine, welcome. Thank you, Sister Lorna. How are you doing? Clive, greetings to you, sir. My sheep hear my voice. Yes, indeed, definitely. And his voice is his word. My sheep hear my word. That's what he's saying. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear... It, you know, it's almost... I'll come to that in a moment. Um, blessings to you and... Um, one love, one love, one love. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I was talking to a brother one day, and I was asking, how do you know the voice of God? And he said to me, well, uh, my sheep hear my voice. I said, yeah, I know Jesus said my sheep hear my voice, but how do you know the voice of God? He said, my sheep hear my voice. I said, yeah, I know that. But how do you know? that you have heard his voice. And he repeated again, my sheep hear my voice. Now what on earth does that mean, my sheep hear my voice? Does it mean that there's a voice in my head that his sheep know? Because that's the kind of indication that people seem to come up with. It's like, because I'm a sheep and I have this special, unique relationship with Jesus, I can hear his voice in my head that's contrary to his word, let's say have nothing to do with his word, but I can hear this voice in my head. That's utter foolishness. There's no Bible for that. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hears his word. And in fact, let's go find that scripture. Um, I think it's somewhere in, in John. My sheep hear my voice. Let's go find that. Find, find that scripture. Let me just do... Right, so let, let's go to that. Yeah, I know it's St. John chapter 10, yeah, 10, 27. Right, let's go there quickly. Let's see, St. John 10 and verse 27. Now, you you got to, you know, when you read, you, you read in, in the context, you know, I and the Father are one is is what Jesus is talking about. There's a feast of the dedication, uh, and it was winter. Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> that, that was what he said. Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The work that I do... In my Father's name, there be a witness of me. You, you've got to get the context of the verse 27. You know, people talk about, you know, my sheep hear my voice, and they're thinking, oh, there's this, there's this voice in my head that Jesus is speaking. Oh, there it is. There it is. I can, I got, because I've got this special relation. There it is. Come on. Let's read the scriptures. I told you, and you believe not, the works that I do, in my Father's name, there be a witness of me. You, you see that? The works that I do in my Father's name, there be a witness of me. But you believe not because you are not of my sheep. 
as I said unto you, as I said unto you. I want you to pick up on a few key words. The works that I do, you know, but I said unto you. You got to pick up on some of these key words. And then he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what? And they follow me. They follow me. How do you follow Jesus? You do what he says. You follow Christ by doing what he says. He said, if you love me, what did he say? If you love me, what happens? If you love me, do what I say. Because that's the proof of loving Jesus. He's doing what he says. He said, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. And so he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know that. Let, let's, let's look at that um, word in the Greek, the word, uh, verse 27. Uh, my sheep hear my, my voice. And this is the one here. And um, it says here, probably came through the idea of discourse, the tone, articulate, um, um, and so on, by implication, an address or a purpose, saying or language, noise, sound, voice. Okay, so that, those are the words that is used. And it's interesting, the actual, the actual um, I didn't know this actually, the actual Greek word is P-H-O-N-E, phone, phone. That's how, that's how it's pronounced, phone. It's interesting, I never actually realized that. So I, I don't think I'll ever forget this phone, P-H-O-N-E. That's where we have the phone, isn't it? That we speak on, right? <laughs> phone is pronounced phone, phone. When you, you, you can see the abbreviation Greekish. Fone, fone. Now, what I'm saying here basically is this. People have oftentimes talked about, I, I hear this voice. I hear this voice. And they will go off of that voice saying, well, that's the voice of the Lord, right? And I was speaking to someone recently and they were saying, the voice of the Lord Someone, someone says, when I feel this peace, I know it's the voice of the Lord. That's, that's sort of foolishness. There's no scripture that bears that up. Because there are people who have done some terrible thing and they felt peace. At peace, d do that person then say, well, that's from the Lord? That wouldn't make no sense, would it? So people often use other terms, but they're not biblical. They're not Bible. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my word and they do it. They follow me. There's the key. They follow me. They follow me. They do what I said. And then he says, he says in the scriptures, you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I say. You do not do what I say. If you love me, keep my commandment. To follow Christ, you have to first of all, hear what he's saying, and do what he's saying. So when people talk about, I hear the voice, really, um, how, do you know, how do you know it was him? There's only one way of knowing, and that's through the scriptures, through the word of God. And um, other people might tell you something else, and it's up to you what you believe. But I believe that Jesus' voice is his word. And he has left it plain and clear for us, and the Holy Spirit is there, to, to give us understanding of the word, to, to break it down for us, to, to, to bring it to us in such an understandable way that we would walk in it, that we would follow him. You, you, how are you going to follow Christ? How are you going to follow Christ if you, if you don't know him? You got to know, the only way you can know Christ is through his word. There's no other way of knowing him. <laughs> so when he says, my sheep hear my voice, the clearest way to put that is my sheep hear my word. Now, you're hearing my voice now, aren't you? Well, voice is what? What is voice? What is voice? Think about it for a moment. I just want you to think for a moment. You're hearing my voice. Uh, but but there, is, there is something that the voice is saying. There is some formulation of that voice. So when you say we hear that voice, you can't be a empty voice that has no no meaning to it the voice has to have relevance to it so the voice of the lord that gives clarity to that voice is his word come on people follow me
<laughs> I don't know how much clearer I can make that. It's it truly is amazing. All right, let me just go back to the comments section, and then I want to share with you what I want to say to you today. Um, Pastor, can you please explain? Um, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes. And, and what is this commandment? The commandment was the voice of God that Moses heard. You see, let, let me say it again. If you hear a voice, yes, some voice or some sound of some sort, there has to be meaning to that voice. There has to be some form of clarity to what that voice is communicating. Are you following me? The voice is not just, if I shout, yes, if I shout, blah, 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 that, that is also sound that you could call a voice if you want. But there is no distinction to it or clarity of understanding of what that voice is saying. So that voice has to have some form of understanding. That is the clue to tell you his voice is his word. Okay, when Jesus was walking with his disciples, they heard his voice talking to them as they were walking down the street. They heard his voice, but the voice was distinctive. In other words, the voice was teaching them, you know, blessed are the, 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 the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the, 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 they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So the voice was understandable, is what I'm saying. His voice is his word. And then they follow his word. That's what Jesus is saying here in, in, in that scripture. All right. Explain 1 Corinthians. Is it 1 Corinthians 7.27? Is that? First, or is that Chronicles? Um, first, C-O-R. Yeah, C-O-R. C-O-R. 1 Corinthians 7.27 and 28. 1 Corinthians 7. Oh, yeah. You're taking me back to where we were. 27. And 28. I think that's where I was um, before. Uh, art thou lo okay. But if, the, if thou, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Neither, nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the, in the flesh. But I spare you. Right. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Now, the truth of the matter is, and, and it's very clear there is, you know, people always say, I have problems in my marriage. <laughs> well, that's normal because the scripture says it quite clearly here. You will have trouble in the flesh. Um, I'm not so sure what key thing you want out of this verse. Uh, if you make, make me know what you specifically want, then I could zoom in on that particular point. So help me there, um, Pam Pam. And um, just give me a little bit of clarity as to a specific point that you may want to focus on. And then I could come back to that. I, th I had already covered it, so I'm not sure what specifically you might want. So that might help me a great deal if you'd help me with that. Um, greetings, Brother Winston. I hope the book is coming on great. Um, Pastor Errol, you did not finish the scripture that was on interesting uh, Jenny, let me know which, what you mean. Jenny, um, First Corinthians 27, you did not finish the scripture. Okay. The reason why I didn't finish the scripture, because I was only looking at the, just this phrase, which is the um, seek not to be loose. And the point I wanted to, to emphasize on there was that by us seeking to be loose, we are disobeying the scriptures. No matter what's going on in the marriage, because the scriptures clearly state Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Every marriage will have trouble. I just wanted to <laughs> let you know that. So let me read that in the good news. Um, 27. Do you have a wife? You know, the, the, the King James puts it, you know, are you bound to a wife? He says, do you have a wife? then don't get rid of her. That's what it says here. It's very plain. Don't get rid of her. 
Are you, are you unmarried? Then don't look for a wife. You know, that, that is also very clear. Don't look for a wife. But the scripture did say, if you cannot contain, and, you know, it's rather to be, better to be married than to burn. Okay? So, there is qualification to that particular point. Okay? But, if you do marry, you, you see the but? Then do not look for what? But, if you do marry, you have not committed a sin. And if you, if, and if an unmarried woman marries, she hasn't committed a sin. But I would rather spare you everyday troubles that married people have. You see that? Married people have problems. So when people come to me and say, you know, I got married, you know, and man, I got problems. I said, that, well, that's about right. <laughs> what, what do you expect? That is about correct. You know, every 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 trouble, every pro, every marriage has trouble. The scripture says it. But I would rather spare you everyday troubles that married people have. So here we are as married people, seeking to get out of the problems that we are in, and the scripture makes it quite clear that you will have problems. I hope that makes sense. I really hope it makes sense. Married people have trouble. So when people come to me and they say, Pastor Errol, my husband, this, my wife, this, and oh man, we're we, we, we just having trouble. Pastor, please come and pray for me. It's not prayer you need. <laughs> you need to understand that that's about right. Let me show you a scripture that most people don't believe is in the Bible. And uh, I'm sure you've heard it before. Um, Job 14. Look at verse 1. It says, Man born of a woman. Okay, let me, let me read it in the King James. Uh, I think I, I love it the way the King James Version puts it. It says, Man that is born of a woman only live a few days. <laughs> but those few days... Oh, Lord, those few days are full of trouble. And then to get married on top of that. Why are you complaining? If, you, if, you, if you're married, right, and you're having so much trouble in your marriage, what are you complaining about? It's the Bible. You will, Paul, the, the scripture says, I was trying to spare you the trouble. But since you got married and you have not sinned, I want you to realize that... Um, you shall have trouble that married people have. It's normal. The fact that my wife, um, let me not use my wife, the fact that I am not coming to bed the time she wants me to, the fact that um, I might be cheating on her, the fact that I'm not giving her enough money, the fact that I am calling her names and bad names. I don't do that, by the way, but I'm just saying, but I don't want you to go away and tell people that this is what Pastor Errol is doing to his wife. You know, one day I was doing a play in, ch in church, in the convocation. It was a convention at the time. We call it convention then. And I was playing, a, I was doing a play, and I was playing the role of a husband that was being beaten by his wife. Man, I played that role so good. Enjoyed it. Uh, afterwards, people were coming to me and, 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 and consoling me, trying to console me, and sorry that my wife was doing all these things to me. I had to say, no, it was only a play. I was only playing. <laughs> but my wife has never, never, ever done those things to me. So praise the Lord for that. I think I have the perfect wife, to tell you the honest truth. I think I have the perfect wife, even though she's not saved. I don't, you know, when I say perfect, I don't mean perfect as in that way. But she, she's not a Christian. She's never been a Christian. And um, I'm praying for her. I've been praying for her since 1984, 86. And she's, she's not a Christian, and, but she's just an amazing, amazing woman. And um, yeah, just amazing woman. But there you have it. It's just the way it is. And she doesn't stop me. We, we have our, I don't call them problems. I call them opportunities, okay? So I don't have troubles. I don't have problems. I call them opportunities. That's what I call them. Anyway, so I hope, I hope that's clear. Now, let me just, we've got 25 minutes left and I, 
I I um we were we were I was I want to conclude properly and the point I'm making somehow I got off onto onto um what did I go off onto I got off onto divorce and remarriage I don't know how I got there but I'm coming to that subject at some point um it's just that I wanted to share with you that scripture that quite tells us and I th I think it was necessary for me to say that because there could be somebody here right now who you're married and you're having some trouble and not realizing you're supposed to have trouble. Now your troubles won't be the same as mine and mine won't necessarily be the same as yours, but married people have plenty of trouble. And you should not be seeking to be loosed from your husband or from your wife. You're going against the will of God if you seek to be loosed. I want you to understand what the scripture is saying. Anyway, let me come up for that because I need to... I might be opening up a can of worms there. Hey, Brother Raymond. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, I wanted to share with you something that, you know, the Lord shared with me. And it's um, St. John chapter 4. Where are we now? St. John, come on. St. John, is it 4 or is it 24? Yeah. St. John. Yes, this one here. Now, you know the story, probably some of you know the story pretty well about, you know, Jesus and the woman at the well. An amazing, amazing, amazing story. If you ever read that, I'm not going to go through the story, but if you ever read that, it's just one of the most beautiful classic literature ever written. One of them. It's, uh, you know, this, the story, the literature surrounding the prodigal son. Absolutely a class a1 literature truly magnificent when you take it and study it it's, it makes the most amazing reading the most amazing um discovery i'm so glad somebody recorded this meeting between jesus and the woman at the well the disciples are not there it's just jesus and the woman at the well what an amazing encounter. What an amazing discovery Jesus and this woman had. It was it is mind boggling, to tell you the truth, when I study it. And um, when I listen to other people and what they have to say about it, it's just blow my mind away. Uh, and it's just so beautiful. It's just a remarkable story. Um, but I just wanted to look in the time we've got left, just as one specific point in that discussion. And it takes place down at the bottom here um, where Jesus started to talk about worship from verse 20-ish um, there. And Jesus, the woman makes a point and then Jesus comes in after her. And uh, one thought, thought I just jumped in my spirit is this is when people meet up with you i'm talking you now what what kind of encounter do they have with you because this encounter between jesus and the woman at the well was one of the most classical meeting ever recorded in history uh, it was just truly amazing sometimes you know, when we walk into a room, you know, we light up the room and, and we are like, you know, the, the, the people that bring such great joy and fun. Some people bring fun and joy to a room when they walk out of the room, when they leave the room. <laughs> Some of us, when we enter the room. Uh, so what traces are you leaving behind is a key point. But they were talking about worship and the woman says, our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say, talking about the Jews, that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. <laughs> you know, she, that's what she brought up. And you know, one of the things I've noticed about Jesus is that when you go through, you know, the, the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels in the book of John, you find that Jesus was approached on several occasions and where he, where he had, um, um, Jesus had to 
respond to certain questions that were asked. And I'm so glad, even though some of the questions were, were designed to trick Jesus or to trap Jesus or to deceive him in some way, man, his, his answers are so profound. And I would like to be like Jesus along these lines. You know, I would just love to be like him. So the woman talks about worship. Why she brings it up is an interesting point. But Jesus is going to respond to her. And I'm so glad this is recorded. He said, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Wow. You mean to tell me we worship here? The Jews, uh, the, the Jews said it's in Jerusalem. And now you're saying both places will be totally disregarded and there won't be no place anymore. He says, you, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and, and, and now is the hour when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So it won't be bound to a place anymore. The location is moved from this mountain that you got or from Jerusalem where people would gather to worship or some people would go to Mecca and so on. Well, the time has come that that's no longer the requirement. The location is no longer the requirement, but there is two specific criterias that are given for true worshippers. Now, he says, the hour cometh, and now is, it's now here, when true worshippers, now if you have true worshippers, it simply means that you can have false worshippers. We have a lot of worship going on, and we have to ask ourselves the question, is it true worship or false worship? Now, two brothers, Cain and Abel, came to worship God. They came to offer their sacrifices. One brought the best of the fatling of the animal. The other one brought from the ground. I thought, I believe he brought the best from the ground. It wasn't the fact that he brought from the ground that was the issue. The scripture never said that was the issue. I hear people saying, because Cain, sorry, Cain brought from the ground Abel brought from the livestock. That's why it was written. No, it wasn't. God made it quite clear when he said to him, why is your countenance fallen? He says, sin light at the door. Sin was the issue. That's why your offering was rejected. So the point here is that... <laughs> You either have a true worshipper or a false worshipper. So when we go to church, okay, let's say you go to church on Sunday, we're now doing the Zoom thing, right? Not everyone in there is being accepted as they worship. Because you're either a true worshipper or a false worshipper. But Jesus gives the, 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 the qualification when he says, <laughs> in spirit, and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And then he repeats himself in verse 24 by saying, God is prayer. And they, that's you and I, or anyone listening to me, that worship him, the qualification must. It's like when you go to the airport, right? They that wish to fly and <laughs> on virgin must have their passport. And a ticket. You, you, you see that? They must have their passport and a ticket. They must have their passport and a ticket. Now, I've been flying for many years. I've been flying since I was two years of age. I've been flying. And I have never, ever been able to get on a plane without a passport and a ticket. Because the airline says, they that travel on this airline must have a passport 
and your ticket <laughs> that you're paid. So the qualification here is in spirit and in truth. And what exactly does Jesus mean by that? What is worship, first of all? Worship is not just what we do in church when we sing. Worship is your entire life. It's the way you think, the way you talk, the way you behave. It's the way you think and talk and behave about everybody else. It's the way you think and talk and behave towards God. It's the way you think and talk and behave towards yourself. And so worship is a 24-hour thing. It's a seven-day-a-week thing. It's an ongoing, non-stop. Everything you do is an act of worship. Everything. It's either directed to God or towards Satan. When it's to God, you, it's knowingly. When it's to Satan, we don't even know we're doing it. Now, the key thing I wanted to focus on before we close is in spirit and in truth. What does it mean by in spirit? You see, God is a spirit, right? That's why Jesus said it at the beginning. God is a spirit. And the only way that we can connect with God is spirit to spirit. Because the scripture says we cannot please God in the flesh. So we must be born again. We must be quickened in our spirit. That's me. We must be born again. So it is a spirit to spirit transaction. That's the reason why unsaved people cannot, in any way, shape, or form, under no circumstance whatsoever, in this life, in earth, or in hell, or in heaven, under no circumstance whatsoever, at any time whatsoever, and be a true worshiper because they're dead. They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually disconnected from God. When you're quickened and your spirit come alive, you're now connected to God. You're now communing with God. You're now in fellowship with God. And you're now qualified to be able to worship Him in spirit. You've got to be born again. You've got to be in spirit. It, it, it cannot be done in the flesh. You see, let me explain this way. When we worship God... We lift our hands. Well, our hands, our flesh is being raised. Our fleshy lip is speaking and moving. But you see, the body is only expressing what you're doing on the inside of your heart. And you, as he quickened, who was dead in trespasses and sins, you who were alienated from God, you who had no connection to God, you were separated from him. Now he has quickened you. He is, you know, quickened. It's like, it's like, for example, I've got this mobile phone here, right? And it's dead. The mobile phone is dead. It's, the charge is, is finished. I can't use it no more. It won't turn on. I can't make a fall. I can't receive a call. The thing is dead. In natural fact, it's just fit for, to throw in the bin. Because there's no use for it anymore. But I have something for you. I have, I have this charger. Aha! And I plug this charger in. Aha! There's life. It's being quickened. Now, when I take this out, it's not too long before it goes dead again. Aha! Let's, let's connect again. See, are you connected to the, fray, the, the, the main frame of heaven? Are you connected to the computer in heaven? <laughs> I'm talking about your soul. You've got to be in the spirit. You've got to be born again. That's the first qualification. You've got to be born again. I am connected. See, I now am getting some juice. Yes, man, into this phone. The phone is now quickened. I could turn it on. I can make phone call. I can receive phone call. I can go on the internet. I can do this. I can watch my film. Let me get into a film here. Wow, I can watch a film. Wow, can you believe that? My children, they open up this Netflix account and they added me. And uh, I'm not going to watch a film. Um, watch, see now, what am I watching? You see that? It's, it's starting up Netflix. I don't even know what, I'm, what, I, what I was watching. I don't even know what that is. Anyway. So what I'm saying is, you must be born again. 
you must be in spirit. You know, talking about your spirit. You gotta be born again. The sweetest thing to do on planet Earth is to be born again. Oh mean. I I I I gave my life to the Lord. I was born again at the age of twenty-two. My only regret is that I didn't do it at fifteen or fourteen or nine or eight. I wish I did. I wouldn't have gone through a lot of the issues I went through in life. Uh, I would have had a plain sail in life, if you like, but I disobeyed the Lord. No wonder the scripture said, before bef um, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Psalms 119. Before I was afflicted, verse 67, before I was afflicted, oh my God, was I afflicted because I had gone astray. But now have I kept thy word. And so you must be born again in spirit. Now, in truth, now that you're born again in spirit, you've got to be walking in truth. What is truth? Pilate asked Jesus. You know, what amazed me about Pilate? Pilate and Jesus was talking, right? What an amazing encounter. And I can't remember what Jesus said to him, but Pilate turned around to Jesus and said, What is truth? He, he, he didn't ask Jesus the question to wait for the answer. And then he walked off. He probably didn't believe that Jesus would have given him the answer. But you know, some time before that, Jesus was talking to his disciples in a, one of his teaching sessions. And he said this to them. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, Jesus is saying, my word is the truth. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. The word the in law is a definite article. He didn't say, I am a way, because if he says, I am a way, that means there are other ways. So when he says, I am the way, that means there's no other way. There's no other truth. So if you are in the spirit and you want to be a true worshiper, you have to be walking in truth. You have to be living by truth. You can't have iniquity in your life that you know about and you refuse to move and expect to be a true worshiper. It will not work. Let me say it again. I want to be clear and I don't want to be misunderstood. If you have sin in your life that you know and you have been told that you shouldn't have and you've been told to get rid of it and you refuse, you're not a true worshiper. You're a false worshiper. So when you go to church and you're lifting your hands, it's not to God, it's to Satan. Okay, you want scripture? I'll get you one. Let me see now. Where can I go? Um, right. Let's see if I can go down to David in Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 68. One of my many scriptures, Psalms 68. Where is it now? Verse. Uh, I thought it was Psalm 68. I don't even know if I've got it right. Let me. Uh, no, no, no. It's not 68. It's Psalm 66. Right. Look. Look at verse. 15 for a moment. Let's come back so make sure everything is running okay. Right. I will offer you, I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats. Verse 16. Come and hear all ye that fear God. And I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. This is the verse I wanted to get to, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? He won't hear you. <laughs> the 
Just like he didn't hear Cain. The Lord will not. Let me, let me see if I could emphasize something here. What do you think the word will not means? You know, sometimes I think we have some strange understanding of Bible verses or Bible texts and so on. But the scripture makes it quite clear. If I regard iniquity, you see, let me explain what regard means. I said it before. I have this extra marital relationship going on with, and in fact, I don't have, but I'm just using an example, please. Right. And I've been told by the Holy Spirit, this is wrong. Get rid of the extra bit and love your wife. And I said, no, I, I can't do it. It's too lovely. It's too wonderful. I can't get rid of that one. No, no, no. Then you have regarded it in your heart. On account of that, the Lord will not hear you. What does it mean he won't hear you? He's deaf to you. So you're no longer a true worshiper. I'm not talking about somebody who is struggling and trying their best to get rid of a particular issue and they're having difficulty. I'm talking about somebody who stubbornly refuses to. You know, like Cain, when God says to, not, not Cain, Adam and Eve, when God says to them, in the day you eat of it, you'll die. And he willfully, you know, hear what the scripture says. It says, Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. It means that Adam willfully disobeyed God. And that's why God said to him, because you have obeyed the voice of your wife and not me, cursed is everything. So the point here is quite simply this, as I go back to my text in St. John 4, is that God requires truth. If you're going to be a worshiper, a true worshiper. Now, I need to make this point very, very clear. That when I go back to John chapter 4, I'm speaking about true worshipers. You see that? Where we, where we find that? True worshipers. That particular greenish one. True worshipers. Are you a true worshiper? You, you know, you've got to qualify to be a true worshiper. There's a qualification. Spirit and truth. That's it. It's no longer in that mountain over there or this mountain down in Jerusalem. It's now not assigned to geographic location or space or any such thing. It's now along the lines Spirit and truth. So it's, if, you're on the, if you're on the plane, spirit and truth. If you're in England, spirit and truth. Jamaica, spirit and truth. This is now the qualification of true worshippers. They obey God. They hear what God says in the scriptures, obviously. And they obey him from the scriptures, obviously. And therefore, they qualify to become and to be and to maintain the status of a true worshipper. You know, one of my goals in life is to be true to God. Is to maintain truth when it comes to God. I hope and pray that your being here today was beneficial. And that we will continue on the road to true worshippers. Worshipping the Father in spirit, being born again and in truth, obedience to his word. There is no other way for us to gain all this benefit unless we trust and obey. There is no other way unless we are born again and unless we obey what the Word of God tells us. God's Word is, and His voice is not difficult to understand. It's very, very Straightforward. God made it very plain. We're the ones that's confusing it in our schools and our universities. 
we are the ones confusing the issue. But when you read this, the word of God, it, it's, it's very clear. You know, don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't leave your wife. Don't leave your husband. I mean, love your enemy. What, what's so difficult about those things to understand? Very, very clear to understand. Yes, there are certain things that might be a bit more complex, you know, like trying to understand the prophecies and so on and so forth. But the basic things that we need to live and to be successful is very simple. There's no complication about it. There's no complication about, you know, about doing what God says. You know, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, don't envy anybody. Very clear what it says. It may not be easy to do, but it's very, very clear in the scriptures. Guys, I want to say thank you again. I got to go and um, be back here again tomorrow, youth night on Wednesday. But I want to give a big shout out to my good friend. Yeah, I got to go back to this too. Um, I want you guys to, to, to go to Sandra uh, Sandra Mayer Designs. Uh, absolutely beautiful website. Actually, I've had a chance to have a look at it. I'm going right back over there. Now, let me go back to the home page. Uh, I think I might have come off of it. Uh, let me see if I can reload it. And yeah, there you go. And there's a number as well. Big and broad right there. 0743414 Give her a call and uh, give her a text, whatever. And go and look at it. It's got a lot of stuff there. The shop is there. Beautiful. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. And so many things that's there. Marks for women and uh, some beautiful masks. I'm glad I saw masks for women. I'm sure men can wear those as well. And these look so fashionable, isn't it? So beautiful. And they, look at that, $8.99. That's really reasonable. I don't think you get the hat with it, though. I'm not sure. So you'd have to phone Sandra and find out famous style. I don't know if the hat come with it or that's a separate cost. Uh, it might tell you in the description. But check it out. Guys, have yourself a fantastic week. And don't let nothing stress you out, trouble you. Take care of yourself until next time. Bye for now. <laughs>